Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. Welcome to CYC. We're at the Coptic Orphans 30th Anniversary Celebration Gala, and I'm going to be doing some interviews, and you'll hear some talks today. The first interview is with the founder and the executive director, Nermeen Riyad. Nermeen, welcome to CYC. Hi, Mimi. Congratulations on 30 years. Thank you. For those who haven't heard of Coptic Orphans, which I can't imagine at this point, anybody has not heard of it, what's this organization all about? This organization is all about children, and it's all about empowering children and letting them reach their God-given potential. The children in Egypt, and especially the fatherless and the vulnerable in Egypt, have an incredible, incredible potential, but it's a matter of how to um, uh, release that and, and to facilitate that. And so Coptic Orphans is all about fatherless children getting an education, able to stand on their own two feet, and not only that, but also being able to support their community and help others as well, sort of paying it forward. So your guest of honor today is Nermeen Samir. She's the mother of uh, a young martyr named Maggie who was only 10 years old when she was killed in a church bombing. Why did you pick her as your guest tonight? Well, I felt in the, she's iconic to all of the cops that I thought were heroic. And I've seen a lot of that in Egypt. I've seen a lot of people where they've uh, suffered tremendously and yet they are an inspiration to us. And, um, and I see that she's symbolic of the difficulties that the cops are facing almost on a daily basis. Uh, the extremes, of course, is church bombings, uh, but nonetheless, um, how we as cops have never retaliated, we've not lashed out, but yet we promote uh, forgiveness, we promote peace, uh, and I really admire that. And, I, and specifically, Nermeen Samir, I really admire her. So is Coptic Orphans doing anything besides you know, educating children and doing that, but to improve the lives of the cops in Egypt as far as security goes, as far as their, um, the ability to live in safety in their own country? You know, it's not about safety, it's about changing mindsets. And is Coptic Orphans about changing mindsets? Absolutely. We're changing the mindset of what it means to be fatherless. It's not about a stigma. We're changing the mindset of uh, the class system. I mean, you, if you're poor and you succeed, well, that's terrific. You know, this is something that, that's really good. We're also changing the mindset of how helpers, those that help the, the vulnerable, uh, look on them. We don't see them as poor and pitiful. We see them as um, people that have incredible potential. And lastly, and then probably one of the most important things, is changing the mindset of how the rest of Egypt looks look upon us as Copts. Uh, this is something that needs a lot of work, but again, little by little, Coptic Orphans is changing even that. 30 years has been a long time. Can you point to one thing that you're most proud of over those years? I think I'm most proud of when the kids who didn't know how to read uh, uh, end up uh, staying in school by the help of the volunteer reps that we have, and not only doing that, but also being able to do so well that they receive a scholarship and uh, that they actually enter into universities such as the British University and the American University. And yes, we have children who now um, not only finished the British University with top honors, they were hired by the British University to also teach as well. So I think, and this of course, this takes years, uh, and I think it's the fruit of the labor of 30 years is what I'm most proud of. And maybe one other thing, I'm most proud um, that God is using us, that God is using us as a tool uh, to do his work. So you really can't ask for anything more. What's your hope for Egypt? My hope for Egypt is a safe, prosperous, uh, uh, peaceful Egypt uh, that honors its people, honors it, the Copts, the Christians of Egypt, um, and celebrates um, that we, we don't have to be, all be the same. That's my hope. Thank you so much for the interview and congratulations on 30 years and I'll bell your 100th uh, anniversary. <laughs> if I live long <laughs> enough. Thank you so much, Mimi. It's a pleasure being here. We are going to take a really quick break. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back.
We're back with another interview, this time with Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. He's a Republican from Nebraska, and we're at the Coptic Orphans 30th Anniversary Gala. Congressman, welcome. Welcome to CYC. Pleasure to see you. Thanks for interviewing me. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that there aren't a whole lot of Coptic Christians living in Nebraska in your district. That's a fairly safe assumption. Why are you interested in this subject? Well, it's, it's a great question, and the answer has multiple levels. Uh, first of all, when I was 18 years old, and it was in 1979, the year in which the peace accord was ratified, signed, finalized between Egypt and Israel, brokered by the United States, the first thing I saw when I entered Egypt was a hand-painted sign, spray-painted, on a twisted pile of concrete and rubble where major fighting had taken place during the 73 war. And the sign was both in Arabic and English, and it said, here was the war, here is the peace. And that was my first experience overseas as a young person. I was so warmly received by the Egyptian people. And of course, at that time, there was a celebratory atmosphere. People would stop me on the streets, kiss me on both cheeks. As an American, it's, you'd adjust. But, I think that early formative experience and experiences wedded me to something very profound. And, and let me capture it for you like this. When I was with a family, a Muslim family in Fayoum, west of Cairo, uh, he was a farmer and there was no English there, but he was very eager, very excited, almost anxious to take me to meet his neighbor. And he grabbed his neighbor's hand and he showed me a tattooed Christian cross, the Coptic cross, on his wrist. And then the Muslim man placed it to his forehead as a sign of respect to say to me, you are welcome here. And so again, one of those beautiful early formative experiences, fast forward you know, 30 plus years, and I'm a member of the United States Congress, the height of the Iraq war, uh, I purposefully chose to get on the Middle East subcommittee because of a, a depth of experience that I'd had in the Middle East, and I thought I could help make a contribution to understanding, to the understanding in the Congress of, of culture and other dynamics that go into decision making. When ISIS came and created the genocide against Christians and Yazidis and others, uh, there's more to this story. I also represent the largest Yazidi population in America, in Nebraska. But combined, the combined effects of, of my own formative experience, what ISIS did to exterminate entire groups of people simply based upon their faith, who have every much a right to be in their ancient homeland as anyone else. And as many Arab leaders have said, if we le lose the presence of Christians and other religious minorities, we lose that leavening influence, that service, that gift of the heart that particularly the Christian community has brought throughout the Middle East, as well as hospitals and schools that have provided so many services. It's, not, it, it's, a, prince, it's a just response to the horror of ISIS, but it also has a deeper meaning. What's at stake here is the principles of civilization itself, this idea of human dignity that must be protected by just governance structures so that the, the conscience of the human person can flourish as it manifests itself in religious freedom. Well, Congressman, so I mean, you've been a, a long time supporter, as you've just said, and, and so eloquently explained why. Is the Trump administration doing enough to help the persecuted Christian minorities in the Middle East? I recently came back from Iraq, and I went to northern Iraq in the Nineveh Plain, where, which has been the traditional homeland for Christians and Yazidis. I went at the behest of the vice president, working with the budget director, Mick Mulvaney, a former member of Congress, very close friend of mine, who has a very deep sensitivity to this issue of the persecution of religious minorities in the Middle East. Um, working together, there's been a shift of funds to help rebuild those communities in the wake of ISIS. Uh, we are working on a new security resolution targeted toward northern Iraq. But I think the larger, deeper issue, particularly for the cops, is this principle of civilization itself, of just governance. How is the contribution of the, the cops, which means Egypt, going to be recognized in the future in a new architecture for the 21st century, which is centered on human dignity? This is a question not just facing the cops, but it's facing all of humanity. This idea of human dignity as it leads to the right type of market, economic systems, 
that provide well-being for everyone, and the right type of governance space that recognizes the sacred space of conscience and religious freedom. So we've aggressively tried to elevate these concerns. Money is targeted, again, to rebuilding the Christian communities. But this is a much deeper architectural kind of conversation that needs to happen throughout the United States government, but also in multilateral bodies everywhere. Can you point to any progress or any actual you know, accomplishment that has been made by this administration? Well, there, I mean, there's direct funding that's given for the organization Coptic Orphans uh, through the, United, the charity of the United States taxpayer. Uh, we are in very strong relationship with the Egyptian government. This is the USAID Correct. funds? Okay. Um, again, we've had a, a shift of, from, of funds to the rebuilding of the religious minority communities in northern Iraq, and we're trying to pursue, again, a new security approach that would really empower people to return home. Of course, other countries like Lebanon are hosting huge numbers of people who had to flee, as is Jordan. Right, huge and, percentages and of their population. Large, I think that 20% of the population of Jordan is refugee status, if I recall correctly, and Lebanon about the same as, as I recall. So this puts tremendous stress on those two countries, which are very important and strong friends. I don't say allies, I say friends of the United States. So we supply large amounts of money there, but your question prompts actually the necessity of the ongoing conversation not just by America, but the entire international community, of the protection of this right of conscience, this sacred space of the human person, human dignity, and threaded through just governance structures. Last question, because I know you got to go, but how are we using the <clears throat> relationship of the United States with the Egyptian government to better the situation of the Christian minority in Egypt? T two years ago, I had a personal meeting with uh, President Sisi. It was two hours long. Now, for a sitting member of the United States Congress to have almost a one, there were four of us, his foreign minister, our ambassador, me, and President Sisi, to give me two hours. He knew my background. He knew that I had lived in Egypt for a time. He knew of my work in Congress on a whole host of things, particularly the bilateral relationship regarding Egypt and America but also the work on protection of religious minorities. It says a lot to me that a president of the country the size of Egypt, Egypt and again, a long friend, and critical, critically important to the stability, future stability of the Middle East. By the way, I kept challenging, even went on Egyptian television to challenge this notion that Egypt has to stop having an entitlement mindset and actually work toward regaining its rightful place as a leader in the Middle East. That's what I want to see absolutely important. The mother of the Arab world, cradle of civilization, leader of, of culture, it's time to reassert that dignified position for Egypt as a key leader in the Middle East. And that's what I would welcome. Congressman Fortenberry, thank you so much for the interview. Thanks for being here. I'm sure Coptic Orphans is thrilled to have you here at their celebration. Pleasure. Thank you. We are going to take a really quick break. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. We're here at the Coptic Orphans 30th Anniversary Gala, and I've got an interview with Taufik Baklini. He is the president of an advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. called In Defense of Christians. Mr. Baklini, thank you for being here, and thank welcome you. to CYC. Thank you. There's a lot of sad news about Christians in the Middle East. Can you say, can you give us some good news that will give us some hope about the situation there? Not a lot. I mean... There's not much good news other than uh, getting direct aid to the Christians uh, of the Middle East. And uh, what the Vice President announced uh, last year at our, uh, during our summit, that uh, getting direct aid to the Christians of the Middle East would be the best thing uh, uh, to do. Because many of them, they don't receive uh, direct aid from uh, the United Nations. So they were always kept out of uh, getting any uh, direct aid. So that was a big uh, a policy change. Uh, the president and um, the vice president agreed to, to go with that policy and start helping Christians directly without... Have you actually seen that happen on the ground or is that yes. just talk? Yes, no, uh, it, it started, it was slow as everything else that goes uh, through the government. So we were able to work with um, the government 
to cut all the red tape and um, be able to help uh, communities that are in need. And have you seen those communities that have been completely devastated by ISIS start to rebuild? Are Christians coming back into the, those areas that they fled from? Uh, yes. I mean, this is what we advocated for four years ago until now. We don't want the Christians to leave uh, the region. We want them to stay. This is where Christianity started. And um, no matter what, we're going to help them uh, rebuild. And uh, a lot of them are returning in Iraq. We need help to rebuild their uh, churches, their communities, their, um, their schools. And this is what uh, USAID is uh, trying to do, as well as other European countries like the Hungarians are giving direct aid as well. It's the only Christian country in the, in the, uh, in, uh, in the world, I believe. Hungary. Do you see the situation of Christians in the Middle East, but in particular the Copts, yes. improving over the coming years? We're, this is what we're trying to do. We have a resolution 673, which would, um, it, it talks about uh, the U.S. Uh, policy, its strategic policy with uh, Egypt, which is an important uh, area for the United States, it's for its national security. But now this brings also the humanitarian side um, the abuses that are happening on uh, human rights issues. The human rights issues is becoming another, another strategic importance for the United States. So all the USA... But why is it why is it important to the United States? Because that's when the Christians in the Middle East, anywhere they are, that they, they're at, if they're in Lebanon or Turkey or anywhere in the Middle East, in Syria, uh, they bring moderation. You don't see it in any other country other than where the Christians uh, they're at. So um, Christians bring a lot, bring moderation, bring education, bring, you know, uh, Christians are uh, forgiving people. So Tofi, here's the, the question though, that, that yeah. maybe, you know, ISIS can be defeated militarily, but the ideology that gave birth to that yes. movement is still there, isn't it? It's still there, and they're very careful. We know the countries that supported it, and um, they're this, as the president here says, they're the same countries that are gonna rebuild the areas in Iraq and Syria. And uh, the president is very uh, supportive on this, and he's, uh, President Trump is a good friend for the Christians of the Middle East. On the Egyptian side, the, so that resolution, it's very important. We have over 50 signatures on it. Of and congressmen of, and Of Senate. members of Congress. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully they'll uh, be able to vote on it uh, soon to stop the, I mean, the Christians in Egypt are getting persecuted, burning churches. And uh, we saw stories uh, about the death of a uh, bishop that uh, happened recently. And uh, we are their voice. We're the voice of the voiceless. They're voiceless people, the Coptic community. It's about, I think, 15 million people that have no say in, ev in anything. Tell me a little bit more about IDC sure. and how you operate and what you have been doing these last few years. Uh, we started the organization in 2014 to advocate for uh, and for the per persecuted Christians uh, in the Middle East. And uh, we want them to stay in their, as I said earlier, in their uh, homeland, in their countries. And we want them to be treated as um, any other citizen in each country. Um, it's like we treat them here in the United States, it should be reciprocal. So the president always, always talk about reciprocal when it comes to uh, human rights issues or um, even uh, economic issues. It should be a two-way, you know, uh, thing. Sophie, what's your biggest priority right now for IDC? For IDC, we're working on, um, on, on Egypt, we're working on Resolution 673. Okay. We want people to support it, call their members of Congress and make sure it passes uh, through Congress. And that would be very helpful for the uh, minorities in the Middle East, the Coptics in uh, Egypt. They, we want them to have equal rights 
So this is one of our big issues on this. Uh, otherwise, we're working on um, helping to support uh, legislation that uh, Congressman Fortenberry is also uh, working on. It's to have a secure Nineveh Plain area to where Christians will be able to rebuild and be safe. How will it be secured, though? It will be secured through uh, the, the minorities uh, in, uh, in that region. They'll be armed? Denver. Yes, yes. They will be under the Iraqi government, and it will be secured uh, through the people that live in the area, if it was Yazidis or Christians or otherwise, any, uh, the minority groups. We don't need anyone to, I mean, to be, we don't want them to be protected by anyone. They can protect themselves. And God willing, they will be able to protect themselves and thank all you. the Christians in the Middle East. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today and uh, thank you for being at this event. Thank you very much. We are going to take a really quick break. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. We're at the Coptic Orphans 30th Anniversary Gala celebration in Washington, D.C., and I'm joined by Father Paul Gerges. He's a priest at St. Mark's Coptic Orthodox Church in Washington, D.C. Uh, and um, Father Paul, I wanted to ask you, you've just uh, experienced this very emotional and, um, you know, the talks and everything. Um, I wanted to get your first impressions. What did you think? All I could think is, like, what responsibility every believer has towards the body of Christ. I was so inspired and so moved by, like, you know, the mother of, of Maggie, Dr. Nermeen, who spoke about the explosion that took place in the Butchersaya Cathedral and the different videos of, we have people, as I was looking at the different videos in the gala, those kids look like my kids. And those villages I've, I've walked through and I, and I began to say, like, I'm a Copt, and those are really my brothers and sisters, and I've never felt more of a, of a pull on the inside to, like, we have a responsibility. We, we, can't, we can't neglect those who are part of this body. Your service is primarily among the youth uh, at the church. I wonder what, what do you tell them about what's going on in Egypt, and how connected do they really need to be? I mean, most of them have been born in the United States and have lived all their lives in the United States. You know, even just listening to the history tonight about some of the, the Coptic influence in the world, and I'm looking at these kids and these youth, I feel like they have to know if you want the pride of being Coptic, if you want to be, get the, the honor of being called a Copt and a child of St. Mark and St. Athanasius, then you have to connect with the rest of the body of, 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 of our Coptic identity and our Coptic family in Egypt and all over the world. What do you think was the strongest spiritual message that you got from tonight? It was actually listening to Nermeen Riyad in, in the way that she, I mean, we heard so many inspiring stories and we heard a, the mother of, of the young girl Maggie who was a 10 year old martyr, so inspiring, so moving. But looking into the face of Nermeen Riyadh, who one day saw some orphans, she took the responsibility of caring for 45 orphans, and now they're serving 45,000 orphans. And I say, what is what God is speaking into each and every one of our hearts? Every single one of us hears a whisper or a move or, or a nudge within us to do something great. And I'm looking at her and I'm saying, here we are at this gala celebrating 30 years of thousands of our brothers and sisters. I felt that, that pull and that identity more tonight of, of just a woman who, who, who really just felt so inspired to, to care. No titles at the time, no big organization, no galas, just somebody who just cared about the Coptic identity. And that, that, that was what was most moving to me tonight. You know, you're a priest at, at St. Mark's, which is in the nation's capital. What do you see as St. Mark's mission, and what's your mission and dream for the church? I believe here at St. Mark's in D.C., we have three core values. Um, one of them is worship, the second one is discipleship, and the third one is mission. And I believe every church has to have a life of worship, you know, corporate and private, as well as we need to be making disciples of Christ. I'm not talking about 
students of, of, of just to, to learn knowledge, to know the stories, to know the history. But I really mean that I believe that we have a responsibility to make true disciples of Christ, which ultimately leads to being the light of the world. And I believe part of our, our, our vision for mission isn't just taking trips. But this night I, I, I felt very moved to feel like we need to take ownership of, of a hurting party, a hurting part of the body of Christ somewhere in the world. Um, we have a responsibility towards Egypt. Even when you see in the book of Acts when they were making collections for the saints of Judea, you know, as they were preaching throughout the whole world, they said, we can't forget the, the, the Jews that are back home being persecuted. And, and, and now the saints of Judea are our Coptic brethren in Egypt. And so I believe that our, the first responsibility we have is towards Egypt um, in the diaspora. As Copts in the diaspora, we, we have to remember the Judean saints. And then at the same time, we have a responsibility um, internationally to, to anywhere where there's crisis in the world. I feel like, you know, we've taken trips to not just Africa, but we went and served with the refugee crisis, you know, in Greece with the, the Syrian refugees. And I just feel like we have, we have to take responsibility of anywhere where there is a cry in the world because God responds to the cries of his people. Um, third is we have a domestic responsibility to, to help, again, the, the people that, to know Christ within our, our country, within our society, and then locally within our direct um, area, you know, Fairfax, Virginia, Northern Virginia, that, that we need to be the light of the world. And I believe that's not just something that we, 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 we highlight in our Bibles, but it's something that we are commanded to be. Father Paul, thanks so much for being uh, with us and for joining us today. Thank you, Mimi. We are going to take a really quick break. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. We're at the Coptic Orphans 30th Anniversary Gala, and we've been doing a series of interviews. Uh, we heard from Dr. Nermeen Samir, who is the honored guest here tonight, um, who's come from Egypt. She's the mother uh, of the young martyr from the Botroseya bombing, Maggie. And um, she's here to talk with us. And uh, Dr. Nermeen, welcome to CYC. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. And. Um, Welcome to America. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. I'm happy to. Nermeen, I don't want you to repeat, you know, the, what happened that awful day, but afterwards your daughter was in the hospital and she was clinging to life. I know that those were very, very difficult days for you Ten and your days. husband. What were you praying about? What did you ask God for? I think for the first three days, I, um, I was asking about uh, healing Maggie. Uh, I just want her to be perfect uh, in front of me. Um, her injury was in her head. So um, I think we were expecting that there will be imperfection in her movement, in her um, um, anything. So we were praying that she will be, um, she was, will be all right without any imperfection, without any paralysis without any anything. I prayed for God to, to be, uh, that she will come out of, the, of her bed and stand in front of me all right, speaking, seeing, um, all, all her functions. Um, after the three days, um, and her condition were, uh, was deteriorating, so um, we started arguing with God. Our prayer were, was very different. I can't believe that uh, that will be, that will be that that is my future. Uh, that I will complete my my life without Maggie. So uh, um, you know, I I spoke to God with denial. Of what we are doing? I know that you are good. So uh, it's not logic that you are good and uh, you do that thing. So what are you going to do? You know that uh, you will do such a thing to me. You know, Nermina, I am fragile. I'm, I can't stand that, uh, that experience. Um, I think that uh, was for three another days. And then after the reality started to sink in, we started to change our prayers. Uh, we started to accept. God's will. I she think had that, started to get worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing was, nothing was better at all. Her kidney stopped. Her, uh, 
her uh, heart stopped and need medication twice. Um, she was on a respirator. Um, her liver was not uh, perfect. Uh, she was unconscious all the 10 days. Um, there was edema all over her body. So nothing was, uh, was changing. Even yeah, nothing, to the, to, to, nothing was better. All was deteriorating. After arguing with God, I think one day I felt that I'm comfortable. I felt that it's okay. Don't bother. She will go to heaven. She will be in, in the best place ever. Uh, I started thinking that I want her to be with me. I want her to, to grow up in front of my eyes. I want her, I want, I want all is I want. What does she want? She surely was, will want to, to be with God in heaven. So, what am I doing? All my thinking changed. I really started to be comfortable. Um, peace comes in my heart. As if a fire end was uh, turned off. Do you feel that God was giving that feeling to you? Surely. Or did you feel maybe you just gave up hope? No, surely. I think as if my prayers was in front of God all the time. And when he, he noticed or he sees that, that I'm, I'm now uh, um, ready to accept his relief, to accept his peace, I think he instantly sent his relief and peace into my heart. Um, so uh, I think after uh, eight days or nine days, we started to, to pray to God, uh, please, we want your will to be, to be uh, fastened. We want, uh, if you want to take your valuable gift, please take it. We, we were very tired of, um, of waiting, of seeing her in that condition every day. And when we prayed this prayer, after a few hours, she passed away, as if God was waiting for us to, uh, to let him have her. Um, he's very you, kind. How did you feel at that moment when you heard the news? Uh, I felt on the floor, as if I, uh, I, I was waiting here to be good or to be all right. I, th I think that um, uh, there was a hope till the last moment. And when we were preparing for the funeral, it was a very hard time. And when she was, uh, they were putting her uh, in the grave, she was very, very hard time. Um, I thought that uh, leave me with her in that tomb. I don't want to, to uh, leave her and, uh, or to go back home and leave her in that uh, You know, graves is, I think we will never accept graves as a normal place, really. I know, I know. But when, when we went to the church, the night we uh, accept uh, the condolences of the people, um, I was very, very comforted. I was, uh, I have great peace in, inside my heart. How though? I, d I don't know. I really don't know. I, when I saw myself, I felt strange that, that what am I doing? What, uh, uh, I just uh, lost my daughter. But um, I don't know what was happening, really. But um, when we took the condolences uh, at that night, I think all people were astonished. I you myself... I was going to say, you were yes. astonished. I myself was astonished. You said in your remarks earlier that it was miraculous what God did for you. Really. And I think that uh, it's more miraculous than healing Maggie. He can heal Maggie with, with his little finger. Really. He can do anything. But to take Maggie and, um, and know how to heal my soul and to deal with me, 
like that, I think it's, it's more miraculous than healing Maggie. How has your life changed mm -hmm. since that awful time? For myself, after the comfort, after the peace I took from God, uh, I decided to talk about God whenever I can. Uh, I will send the message that God is good whenever I can. Um, um, you know, everything in the life seemed smaller than it was before. I learned how to not to love anything very much and not to hate anything very much. But I want to ask you about hate because I want to know what your feelings are towards the people that did this yeah. to you and the people that took your daughter away. I feel pity for them, really. Not no, hatred, not anger? Even for once. No, just pity. You know, uh, I know that Maggie, uh, uh, when she was among us, she was happy and she lived a very happy life. And I know now that she's in the best place ever. So, uh, you know, that uh, she, uh, she earned her life on the earth and she earned her eternal life. But for the man who did that, he was in misery in the, in, on earth. And so she, he, he killed himself. And now in the eternal life, he is in misery too. So it's incomparable. So I can't, um, uh, I can't feel anything, just pity. You're a, you're a pharmacist, you're a lecturer, you have a lot to do professionally. But I wonder what you see as your mission now as the mother of a martyr. You know, I think my mission did not change before and after Maggie. Uh, before Maggie, when, when, um, when I took my PhD and become a lecturer in the university, I said to myself that God sent me as a lecturer to, to be an example, to be a light, to be a salt. So behave like this all your day and all your days. So I started to communicate with, um, with my students. I started to make, uh, you know, um, when you try to make uh, a role model, when you try to make, uh, I hope that uh, I make it, but um, I'm working on myself in that point. After Maggie, uh, I think this mission is, is completing, it's, it's still with me. But you know, people who look, uh, uh, she's a mother of martyr, uh, what she's doing, what she's wearing, what she's... So I think I... Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to be as God wants. I'm trying to be uh, a light and uh, pray every day that God may help me in that. I think the mission that is related to Maggie, that every mother that loses a child and needs a comfort, needs uh, to have uh, a relationship with God, and she, uh, she uh, does not think in, in that, uh, I go to her and uh, start speaking about God and about uh, that uh, whatever the experience, whatever the trouble, whatever, Whatever we go through, God is there. So um, we, should, we should hold him tightly, we should uh, be with him all, all, always, because comfort is in him only. Safety and security is in him only. Nowhere is safe. Uh, no, um, uh, you know, whatever, whatever we do and, and feel uh, uh, I'm secure here, I am, uh, if, I, um, if I am in this job, uh, I will be okay. Nothing is guaranteed. So we should, we should know that security is in him only. So just be in his, uh, just be with him all the time and we will be secure. What do you want the Coptic people living in the West to know 
And, and what do you want them to know about Egypt and, and the situation in Egypt? Egypt is blessed. That's um, a fact we should, we should agree with. And Egypt is blessed. And uh, with, with all the monasteries we have, with all the priests we have, we, and we are protected in the name of God. So, I think people in West, just if they can donate to the poor people in Egypt, to the churches that uh, needed to be uh, built, I think nothing else. I think they can't help in the problems in Egypt about closure of churches. Um, I think so. I think that they can't help in closure of, of churches. It's, um, I don't know how can we solve that. But uh, first of all, prayers will solve that. But their donation money, or I think, w would help a little bit with the poor people, with, um, with building churches. Dr. Nermeen, you, you, know, you were invited here as the, the guest of Coptic Orphans. Why did you want to come? Why did you want to come and give a speech here in Washington and in Toronto? Why? After I met Nermeen Riyad in Cairo, and she spoke uh, about Coptic orphans and their mission and what they did with people in, uh, in Egypt. I was impressed. I felt that it's too good to be true. And when she, um, she uh, made me watching a video about Justina, I think that you are changing lives. Oh, you are incredible. I believe in Coptic orphans and I, um, I think that um, it's a light in the darkness of Egypt and in the poverty of Egypt. So um, I would like to help them in the way they would like me to help. So when Nermeen offered me to come to Washington and to Canada to, uh, to be a guest in their galas, I felt it is um, a golden chance to help Coptic orphans. Really, uh, I think Coptic orphans is a plus in Egypt. You said in your remarks that, um, that God can change sorrow to joy. Yeah, really. I mean, the sorrow of losing a child is beyond comprehension. Sure. How? How did you feel that he could change I your don't sorrow into joy? I, for myself, I don't know, really. And I said that um, nobody, no book can comfort anybody. Only God, when he touches the soul, when he touches the heart, he can change it from, from sorrow to joy. And he promised us that our joy will, may be full. So he is not a liar. So, uh, I think um, I trusted him in the past and I will trust him in the future all the time. He, uh, he fulfilled all his promises. What did you learn about God because of this experience? I experienced God all over my life, not in the last experience. And I learned about God that He is good and He, he loves us very, very much. And uh, whatever happened in, in our life on earth is nothing comparing to the eternal life. So whatever happen, happened in, on the earth, I think uh, I'm waiting for my eternal life. Even my life uh, will be 90 years or uh, 100 years, it will end at last as this is the only, is the only truth we know. So I think um, I, I'm waiting for my eternal life to begin. Dr. Nermeen, thank you so much for joining us and for your, your wonderful words to us. Thank you. thank you. That's our program. I hope you enjoyed it and thanks for joining us. If you have any comments or questions, be sure to get in touch with us. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And I hope you enjoyed hearing about the um, situation of the Copts in Egypt and hearing the inspiring stories. And I hope you're moved to, um, to, to maybe do something and get involved. And um, we will uh, talk to you again in the next program. Thanks for joining us.